Hello again, everybody. Uh, this week we are discussing Epicurus and we are using Epicurus and uh, his theory of pleasure in the good life as an example of what the theorists in the Hellenistic period of ancient philosophy were doing. Uh, so roughly, one common theme that runs throughout the different Hellenistic schools of thought um, is the theme of tranquility. And so all of these theorists are giving uh, a philosophical theory which tells us how we can come to sort of have peace of mind, how we can come to be free from mental trouble, how we can be free from that mental pain. Um, so although the theories do many other things, right, one underlying uh, theme that ties them all together is this uh, attempt to find a solution to this tranquility problem, right? How can we live uh, in this tranquil lifestyle? Okay, so we're using Epicurus as an example of this. Uh, the Stoics and the Skeptics are also uh, two different types of theorists in the Hellenistic period who are worried about the same project, but uh, the Epicurean one I think is more interesting, and so we're going to spend our time focusing on this one uh, as the example. Okay, so Epicurus... <clears throat> He thought that philosophy should not just be an intellectual discipline. So there were multiple schools of thought, uh, multiple different philosophical schools in the ancient world. And it's thought that a number of them had taken a turn toward the purely sort of theoretical or academic lifestyle, right? So philosophy was something that uh, people spent days thinking about, but trying just to determine the theoretical truths about the world, right? The things they were discovering didn't really have a lot of practical impact, right? They didn't do much to tell you how your life could go better, right? So understanding uh, how the planets function around one another, figuring out what the ultimate truths of the universe are, those are interesting things to do, but they don't, uh, interesting things to figure out or interesting problems to solve. But they don't seem to have much of a practical effect on your life, on your day-to-day -day life. It doesn't seem to make things go any better. So Epicurus wanted to change that. Right? He thought philosophy should be an actual applied practice that makes our lives go better. Uh, so keep that in mind. He's trying to turn this into sort of, well, not turn it, but make the focus more of a practical discipline. And the practical output would be your life going better. So how one way in which we can do that is by going through that common theme of tranquility, right? So if philosophy gives you the type of information you need to have peace of mind, then your life will go better. Uh, and for Epicurus, we could reach this state of tranquility uh, primarily through the elimination of irrational sources of fear and a discussion of what the best human life is like. Why would that be? Well, if philosophy can tell you what the best human life looks like, then you can structure your life to match that and then supposedly live a tranquil and happy life. Uh, also, if you have irrational sources of fear, philosophy can point out that they're irrational to you. And so you can eliminate those as sources of fear. The less fear you have, the better your life is going to go. The less fear you have disrupting your mental state, the easier it will be for you to have a tranquil mental state. Okay, so what were the sources of fear? Um, so his philosophical method uh, can be sort of applied to more topics than this, but he thought that there were two major sources of fear that we could eliminate just by doing philosophy. And that's the fear of the gods and the fear of death. So why do people fear the gods? Well, there's a number of reasons we could list off here, right? But for the most part, we think that um, the gods have the ability to judge us or punish us in the afterlife. And so many people fear God because they see God or the gods as the ultimate judge of themselves, right? So I will be judged and possibly punished by these things. And so I'm afraid of them, right? If this thing has the power to send me to hell for all of eternity, I should be afraid of that thing. Uh, especially in the ancient Greek world, they thought that uh, the pantheon of gods had more sort of um, interaction in the daily lives of people, right? So the gods were interjecting themselves all the time and affecting people uh, either positive, positively or negatively. Uh, essentially, the gods had more control over each individual person's destiny 
Uh, and so that's another reason to fear the gods, right? If the gods can come down into the world, interject themselves into your life and screw things up for you, that's another reason to fear them. And so there's good evidence that we fear the gods in this way, right? We pray, we do um, sacrifice, especially in ancient Greek times, there's some ritual sacrifices. And then going just through all the other rituals they go through, in order just to please the gods, right? So you're spending all this time trying to please the gods because you're afraid of them harming you or diminishing your quality of life or sentencing you to hell for all of eternity, not bringing you rain so that your crops dry up, so on and so forth, right? Okay, so that's why we would fear the gods. Secondly, he thinks we can eliminate the fear of death. And this one obviously doesn't need much explanation. It's one of the most common fears people have. Uh, but one thing I want to be clear about here is Epicurus isn't saying you shouldn't fear the act of dying, but you shouldn't fear death itself, right? So the act of dying might be something you should fear. Uh, the act of dying might be very painful for you. Very few people are fortunate enough to go sort of quietly in their sleep, uh, whether it's heart attacks or cancer or uh, getting hit by a bus, right? There's always something uh, that could cause you pain there, and that is something that's worth fearing. But Epicurus isn't talking about the act of dying. He's talking about death itself. All right, so why might we fear death itself? Well, there's a number of reasons, right? It's unknown. We don't know what's going to happen to us. It could be uh, nothingness, right? It could just be complete annihilation. It could be eternal heaven. It could be eternal hell, so on and so forth. Uh, so the unknown is scary. People are scared of punishment in the afterlife. People are scared of leaving loved ones behind or not being able to finish uh, uh, projects they started that they care about, so on and so forth. All right, so people fear the gods and people fear death itself. And Epicurus thinks that we can eliminate the fear of both of these if we uh, end up with the right philosophical theory. Now, an interesting thing about Epicurus is he held the atomistic view of the natural world. So the atomists that we talked about in the first week of the course, uh, Democritus and Leucippus, right? Epicurus is another one of these types of philosophers. So he thinks atomism is the correct medical, metaphysical theory of the universe. Uh, so only two for just a quick overview, right? We don't need to go through this again in detail, but there's just two things that exist. There's atoms and there's void. The atoms are these eternal and unchanging objects. They move downward in the void, but they don't move perfectly parallel to each other. So sometimes they collide with one another and they become entangled. And when they become entangled, uh, they appear to form physical objects or people. Okay, so he thinks this is the true metaphysical theory. This is the nature of reality. And then he says, okay, instead of just doing metaphysics, I want to take the metaphysical theory I think is true and see what it implies for the good life or for ethical theory. So what we say about the fear of death and the fear of God, he thinks can be eliminated if you're an atomist. Okay, so let's look at the God uh, question first. Right? Why shouldn't we fear God? Well, for an atomist, everything in the universe is composed of atoms. There's nothing outside of those two things, right? The only things that exist in the universe are atoms and void. So everything that exists within the universe also has to be made of atoms. So number one, this means we don't even need God in the first place to create everything. Right? The atoms are eternal and unchanging, just as God would be if God existed. Right? So you don't need God on the atomist theory. But even if God does exist, or there's some set of gods, well, then they're not these immaterial things the way we think of them now. Right? If there were gods in the atomist world, those gods would also be made out of atoms. And so this implies a lot about the nature of God. Uh, we're going to list a couple here, but there's, it changes a lot about your conception of God if you think God is just made out of atoms. So first, this takes away the power of God as the creator of all. Right? God didn't create you. God didn't create the universe. God didn't create the atoms that made up the universe. He just is himself made of atoms. He was created by the atoms, or they were created by the atoms in the same exact way you were. Second, let's just assume there is a God in this atomistic world. Well, then he's also just a material being. 
He's also just a material being made out of those atoms. So God is going to be subject to the same physical laws we are. And God will not be eternal because God can be destroyed. If his atoms ever um, fall out of the organization they are currently in, uh, he will fall apart. Right. So just as when we die, our atoms disperse and go on to form other objects, God would be subject to those same physical laws under the atomist picture. So I think once you get a grasp on those two things, it's pretty easy to see why we shouldn't fear God. If God is just another type of material being, and he's subject to all the physical laws of the universe, well, then God does not control your destiny, and he doesn't have any real control over you in the first place. Uh, God could be a stronger, or bigger material being. Uh, he would just be sort of like a big, powerful alien at that point. But he wouldn't have any power over your soul, destiny, or afterlife. Right? God cannot control the function of the atoms. God is just subject to the physical laws of the universe. And so God can't do things that would affect your destiny or fate. He also is not the final judge over you. right? So that was another reason why we said people fear God. We fear that they'll be judged poorly and they'll spend eternity in hell. Right, But if God is just made out of the atoms, he is not the eternal or final judge uh, in all decisions about what happens to you after you die. So if you're an atomist, you shouldn't fear God. God's just another physical thing, doesn't have any control over your life, isn't the final judge of your worth or being, can't um, force you to live an eternal life in hell if your life doesn't go the way he wants it to. Okay, so now you know why we shouldn't fear God from the atomist picture. <clears throat> so now we're going to move on to discuss why we should not fear death. But I want you to do this before we start the next video, so we're going to stop here. All right, think about atomism for a second, and think about why it implies that we should not fear death. Okay, and we'll answer that in the next video. Thank you.